uh, get back down to it. My name is Pastor Zach Langer from Taylorville United Methodist Church, and I am glad to be here with you today. Now, uh, we, before the break, uh, before we paused for Christmas and New Year's, we were going through the parables of Jesus. These are the stories that Jesus told to explain his teachings. And a lot of times they seemed kind of more confusing than a simple explanation would have been. But the power of these stories is that you can fit so much more into a story than you could into a lecture. And beyond that, for the people who heard and reflected on these stories, the things that they learned from Christ became so much more real to them. And so, as it turns out, these were a perfect teaching tool, not only for us to understand, but for us to be formed. So we've made it all the way to Matthew chapter 24, and this one is a little bit hard to simply pin down. So we're going to read the parable together first, but then I'm going to take a step back and we're going to look at what leads up to it. And so uh, we are going to look at this this parable, which is uh, the lesson of the fig tree, or the parable of the fig tree. And it's in uh, Matthew 24, verses 32 through 35. This is what it says. Now, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. This is one of those passages that people look at pretty often when they're talking about uh, the, the end of days, the apocalypse, the final things, the end of the world, whatever you want to call it. And I think that there's there's good reason for that. But when we approach these kinds of these kinds of passages in Scripture, we have to remember that there are a few different wor- uh, ways to understand this. And I'm not going to tell you that one of these is correct, because the truth is, when it comes to uh, end times talk in Scripture, generally speaking, there are three ways that are all correct, because the beauty of scripture is that it can speak to more than one thing at a time. So this is true when we look at this passage, but it's also true if you look back at at Old Testament apocalypse writing, say Daniel, or New Testament apocalypse writing, say Revelation. And that's that they're speaking to three things at once. First, they're speaking to the immediate state of the people. You have to remember that these were written and told to real people who had real things going on in their lives. The second way is to speak about the nature of God, something sort of eternal, the way that God has always been and will always be. And then the third one is the one that we in the Western world tend to fixate on, and that is the the talk about the ultimate the final, the end of the world. Now, we can spend a lot of time looking back at at how these three things are revealed in in Daniel or Revelation, and those are things that I'll probably do with y'all at some point. I've done them with our Wednesday night small group, Uh, but for right now, we're looking at the fig tree. So let's take these one at a time. What is the immediate lesson of the fig tree? Well, if you look back at what Jesus is talking about, the very beginning of this chapter, verses 1 and 2, Jesus is talking about the temple. So it says this, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see all these things, he asked? Truly, I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. So the, the, the disciples tell Jesus, look at how beautiful this temple is. And Jesus' response is, yeah, it's going to be destroyed. It's coming down. And so they ask him, when is this going to happen? And that's the first part of what Jesus is talking about, is the destruction not only of the temple, 
with the fall of Israel as, as they knew it. They were under Roman occupation. Things were already bad. But Jesus tells them, watch out for the signs of the times. For when the twigs of the tree grow tender and the leaves come out, these will tell you that the end is near. Not just the end of the world, the end of Israel, the end of the temple. He warns them about something that Daniel had mentioned in his writings too, his prophecy, the abomination that causes uh, desolation. In other words, that the temple would be desecrated. And Jesus tells them, this generation will not pass away until these things have happened. And indeed, just 40 years after this, the Romans destroyed the temple and exiled the Israelites. And so Jesus' words in the immediate were true. What they knew as the kingdom of God, which was the kingdom of Israel, was not much longer for this world. And even though a great many people from that generation would have passed away before that came to pass, not all of them would. And the generation would not pass until Israel was no more. Now the second thing is talking about the nature of God. And this is one that I think we neglect and we shouldn't. Because what God is telling us here is that we can see what he's doing simply by looking at the work of his hands. God is not in the business of uh, surprising us, even though in a lot of ways uh, we are surprised by his works. What Jesus tells us in the next verse on from what we read is that nobody's going to know when the end comes. Nobody knows who, or, uh, nobody knows when God is going to put an end to all of this. About that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, Jesus says. But we are able to see what God is doing. He does give us signs. He does reveal himself. And he will continue to reveal his work as time goes on. And that's the, that's the eternal uh, truth that we need to take from this as well as the fact that the words of Christ are trustworthy. That we can believe him when he says, we will see God's work. Now the final part of this, the third branch of interpreting the apocalypse, if you will, is the ultimate. And this is where we get caught up, and I think this is probably the most dangerous part uh, of, of reading these kinds of passages. Because even though we believe no one will know the day and the hour, we still think that maybe we might be able to see the day and the hour. We might know what's coming. But if we look at what we know to be true in the eternal, which is that God's work is visible, we can also see the signs of uh, the times in other ways too. One of the challenges for people reading through church history is that every generation believed that they were going to be the last one, that Jesus was going to return during their lifetimes. And that's how it's supposed to be. We are supposed to live with a certain degree of urgency because we know that Christ will come again and that it very well could be today. It could be just a few hours from now. And yet, what we need to watch out for are the signs of how things are going. Jesus was warning them about the abomination that brings uh, desolation, the desecration of the temple. And we can see the signs of, of danger all around us as well. This means watching out for false teachers within our churches, watching out for injustice in the world around us, seeing the places where our society and our culture fall short of the good news of Jesus Christ and the glory of God. And as we see these things, we recognize them not only as a sign of the times, not only as signs that, yes, things are not as they're supposed to be, 
and will come to an end eventually, but also as a reminder of our own need for grace. Because ultimately, for as, as much as we like to talk about the end of the world as being a kind of frightening thing, ultimately it's supposed to be a, a, a point of joy, especially for us as Christians, because where we tend to talk a lot about the destruction of the old way of things, what we're forgetting to talk about is the fact that when Christ returns, we will see him face to face. We will stand in the presence of God, our Father. We will know what it means to experience the fullness of perfect love. And so when we see the signs of the times, when we see the twigs get tender and the leaves coming out, so to speak, we should be letting it that remind us that God is not far from us. And so as we go into this new year, friends, let's remember that God is not far. Let's remember that Jesus was talking about more than just the end of the world here. He was talking about eternal truths that we cannot forget. Let's pray together today. Gracious God, we thank you for the beginning of a new year. Lord, I pray that you would take this year and use it to your glory that you would give us the strength and courage to go forth in your name. That you would help us to shine your light into the world so that in this year, you might be proclaimed in new ways and in new places and by new voices. For those of us who are sick, Lord, I pray that you would bring healing. For those of us who are grieving, Lord, that you would bring comfort those of us whose strength is failing, that you would be our strength instead so that we might stand firm on your promises. And Lord, I pray that you would bless each of us and all of the things uh, that we do. I pray these things in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, everybody, thank you for being here with me today. Go with the grace and peace of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the comfort and fellowship of his Holy Spirit upon you today and every day.